All right, guys, welcome to our next star review unit. Today we will be reviewing the age of Jackson, or the presidency of Andrew Jackson. We will talk about his presidency, and we will look at some of the important events that happened under his presidency. First, let's talk about his background. He was born in Tennessee in a log cabin. He was actually the first president born outside of Virginia and Massachusetts. He was also the first president not to be rich. He was nicknamed Old Hickory. This is because Hickory is a very strong wood. He was said to be a very strong man. He was a war hero from the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812. And it's said that he appealed to the common man. Why do you think this is? The reason he appealed to the common man is because he was common himself. He was born in a log cabin. He was a self-made man. He was not always rich. He was also a war hero. All of these things appealed to common people. Let's talk a little bit about his political party. He began the Democratic Party, which is still around today. The reason he began his own political party is because he wanted to put an end to corrupt government. He felt that he was cheated in the previous election with John Quincy Adams, and so he wanted to end all corruption in the government. He also wanted to give power to the common people. At this time in the government, the rich people ran the government. They had all the government jobs, and they basically ran everything in the government. So he wanted to give power to the common people. Now, as you can see here, we have a donkey drawn here. That is the Democratic symbol. So when you look today at the Democratic Party, the donkey is the symbol. And this all began with Jackson. When he was running up against his running mate, his running mate said that he was a jack and I'll let you fill in the blank there. And so this is why they made, they made the donkey as the symbol of the Democrats. Okay, now let's talk about power to the common man and what this means. At this time, suffrage was expanding. And remember, suffrage is the right to vote. States took away the land ownership requirement to vote. So no longer did you have to actually own land to vote. So now regular people were allowed to vote for the president. Common men were allowed to vote for the first time. Well, who do you think they're going to vote for? Obviously, they're going to vote for someone who is like them, which was Andrew Jackson, since he was also born a common man. So does expanded suffrage affect who gets elected? Well, I think it does because, like I said, if we give common people the right to vote, they are going to vote for someone who is common like they are. And so this is one of the big reasons why Andrew Jackson was elected president. And here's our farmer right here, our common man. A new political party emerges. Like we said, Jackson is the founder of the Democratic Party. Now his party platform, or the reasons he ran, was to end corruption in government, like we talked about, and give power to the people. Now, since he thought the government was very corrupt at this time, he created what is called the spoil system. This is where he gives government jobs to his supporters or his friends. One reason he did this was to get corruption out of the government. Another reason he did this was to have people that he trusted around him to help him make decisions. Now, what did the Democrats believe? First of all, most Democrats at this time were from the South. So when you think of Democrats, think of the South. They believed in a limited federal government, a lot like the Anti-Federalists, and strong state government. They believed that states had certain rights. They also believed in an agricultural economy or farming. They did not want a national economy or national bank. And they did not like tariffs, obviously, because they were from the South. And we've talked about how the South disliked tariffs at this time. Next, let's talk about his Indian policies. At this time, the U.S. was expanding. This was during the time of Manifest Destiny. As the U.S. is expanding, settlers are starting to move south and move west. And as settlers move, they are encountering lots of Native American tribes. So these settlers start to pressure the government to remove Native Americans. The reason is they want this land for farming. And so Congress creates what is called the Indian Removal Act. 
This is where the president is given power by Congress to negotiate removal treaties with the Indians. The Indians in the southeast United States did not want to move. They were happy with their home. They did not want to give up their land. And so the Cherokee went to the Supreme Court in the court case of Worcester versus Georgia, and the court actually ruled in their favor. They ruled that the Cherokee could keep their land. Well, Jackson decided to ignore this ruling, and he tells the Cherokee that they must move to a reservation in Oklahoma. This was called the Trail of Tears. This is when thousands of Indians were marched to Oklahoma to the reservation in harsh conditions, and many of them died. Next, let's talk about the bank crisis under Jackson. Remember, Jackson was a Democrat, and the Democrats did not want a national bank. Well, we know that the North likes the national bank because it gives loans to their factory owners and helps people get more jobs. The South dislikes the national bank because it favors the rich, and they believe it favors the North because, like I said, the bank is giving loans to factory owners, whereas there is farming in the South and not factories. Now, Jackson is a Democrat from the South, so obviously he dislikes the National Bank. Congress decides to approve the renewal of the National Bank. So when it came up for renewal, Congress said we need to keep it. Well, Jackson decided he wanted to veto Congress's decision. He said that Congress was, Congress was wrong, they didn't need a National Bank, and so he nixed the National Bank or got rid of it. Do you think Jackson is acting like a king here? Well, many people did because Congress made this decision, and he went against what Congress said. So a lot of people said that he was acting like a king when he vetoed the National Bank. And finally, let's talk about the nullification crisis. To understand the nullification crisis, you need to understand protective tariffs. Now, at this time, protective tariffs divided the nation. The North liked protective tariffs because they taxed foreign goods and made people buy more goods from American factories, which were in the North. The South hated protective tariffs. They made goods more expensive. The South liked buying goods from Europe, which were cheaper, but these tariffs made those goods more expensive. Congress passed what is called the Tariff of Abominations by the South. South Carolina disagrees with this tariff, and they say they are going to nullify or cancel the tariff. They say it's the state's right to find a law made by the nation unconstitutional. John C. Calhoun, a South Carolina senator, says that South Carolina will secede if the U.S. makes them pay this tariff. Jackson responds to him by saying he will use force against South Carolina if they secede. So the great compromiser as we know him, Henry Clay, steps in again and makes a compromise which lowers the tariff. South Carolina gets what they want and this is seen as a win for states' rights. That is all for this unit. When you are done, go ahead and take the quiz.